All right, what's going on guys? Last week I said it might be the last discoveries video that I make here on the channel. But of course, right after I posted that video, you guys started sending me all kinds of stuff. So as you can clearly see, we got more to talk about today. Now the findings today range from some really simple gameplay stuff, a little bit of myth busting, some extremely notable and important cut content, and also some very wild lore theories that I think you're gonna be very interested in. So as we dive into it today, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button. The channel is inching closer and closer to 50k which is absolutely wild to me and i can't say thank you enough but with that out of the way let's get into it one of the best things about from software games is the extremely meticulous attention to detail even at times when they know the player isn't going to notice it and this little gameplay feature is one of those examples the wing of estelle is a weapon that i don't see get as much use as it probably should it has an incredibly unique move set and is honestly just really visually appealing with a cool lore note of it being a physical part of a boss. But did you ever wonder what might happen if you take it back to its former host? Well, did you know that it actually gets a little bit of a power up? When using the wing of Estelle near Estelle while he's alive, the heavy attack of the weapon actually goes a little bit faster and makes a different sound than when it's away. So check this out. So that is a super cool detail and a really interesting find, and definitely begs the investigation of other boss weapons that may have some unique interactions like that. This next discovery is one of those kind that raises more questions than it answers, especially from a lore perspective and it's going to tie in later on in this video, because I'm sure one thing that still remains mostly unexplained in the lore of the game are the extremely weird and unsettling two fingers. They're said to be envoys of the greater will, the agents of action within the world. World, but we still don't really know what they are. Why are they fingers? Why did they appear wounded and decayed? I have no idea, but recently I've been investigating the botany of Elden Ring, looking into some of the plant life, with a goal in mind of figuring out exactly what the Erd Tree is. And I came across something really interesting. The two fingers that we find in the round table hold appear to be made of flesh, able to bleed and with reflective skin. But did you know that the two fingers of the demigods that we find atop the Divine Towers actually appear to be made of wood? You can clearly see that beneath their skin is tree bark. Now, it could just be a really Really weird texture of muscle striations, but I feel like if that were the case then it would have been red and it would have also been easier to use the same model as the one in Round Table Hold. But you can also notice that the ground they're encased in is soil, with grass growing out of it, very out of place on top of a stone tower. If we take a closer look at Ronnie's two fingers, which appear to also be made of flesh, even at the time of its death, it's already being overrun by mushrooms. Now, I'm not going to come to any conclusions along this theory path as I'm still developing it, but let me know what you think all of this means down in the comments below. Up next is a fun little gameplay secret that I'm honestly really surprised anybody managed to pull off. But did you know it's actually possible to kill Melina at a side of grace? Now I do think the spell combination used here was Fire's Deadly Sin and Freezing Mist for Frost buildup, but it does let us see a pretty cool death animation that you can also find in the Morgoth fight with her signature Erd Tree incantation. Unfortunately, we don't get to see if she drops any runes, but I did talk with the creator and they said she does respawn at the next side of grace. Either way though, that is a really cool find. So this next one is very interesting. We've talked in previous videos about how the Great Jar Warriors, the NPCs that you summon in front of the Great Jar and Kaelid, are actually the builds of other players who have completed the challenge. And so in general, we assume that the characters you fight in the Fias Champion boss fight worked the same way. And it kind of does, but the reality of it is really cool. According to Matt Gruen over on Twitter, every time you allow Fia to hug you, the game reads your build and creates a copy for the Fias Champion boss fight, so anytime you choose the option to be held, it appears that your player is becoming a candidate for the boss fight. Now it does raise a few questions though, since a lot of players are going to be taking that option very early in the game. At least from my experience, it didn't feel like I was going up against new players. The builds that I faced at the time seemed relative to my stage in the game. Now Matt did say in the comments of that post that this also applies when entering her dream to fight Fortisax, and they also said 
that it has not been confirmed whether or not there is a level scaling system involved. However, I highly doubt the selection is entirely random. But unlike the Great Jar fight where you have to actually complete the challenge in the first place, it does appear like players that reach the round table for the first time are being entered into that pool. So perhaps when this gets investigated more in the coming days, we'll figure out exactly what the intricacies are. The next one we're going to talk about today is quite possibly one of the best discoveries in Elden Ring so far. And it was made by Sekiro Dubi, whose channel I cannot recommend enough. I'll have the link to this full video down in the description below. But they managed to restore the entire cut quest line for Kale, and I have to say it was a shame that this was cut, because I can imagine this would have been a lot of y'all's favorite quest in the entire game. Now I'm not going to show the whole thing here because I would encourage you to go watch it over on their channel, but essentially the quest line revolves around you helping him find his way back to the Grand Caravan of Merchants. And if you've dove into the lore surrounding those characters, then I'm sure you can figure out where it's headed. The player would have to seek out these burial crows around the map that contained encoded messages that you would give back to Kale. It's honestly a really cool concept, and I do wish they would have kept this part in the game. But towards the end of this quest, we would have gotten one of the best voice acting lines in the entire game. So take a listen to this. They think we worship the three fingers that we called the maddening sickness down upon them. Well, if that's what they expect from us, then that's what they shall get from us! The world of Grace and his people should have been content to see us sink between the cracks, but to have intruded upon our solace, having broken us upon their whims, never forgive any of you. But without spoiling too much of it, I have to give a massive shout out to Sekiro Dubi. Absolutely incredible work on restoring that. So y'all definitely go show them some love after this video and let's move on. The next one is a really fun bit of trivia, and it really goes to show how good From Software is at organizing their in-game rendered cutscenes. But there's been a mod release called the Photo Mode mod, which allows the player to clip the camera away from their character and go and find details around the map. And it's led to some very interesting findings to say the least. But did you know that in the ending cutscene, for the standard Elden Lord ending, the game actually renders in two statues of America. But they're able to hide this with the way the camera pans, even though the second one is just kind of hanging out right outside the view of the player. But for those of y'all that didn't know how From Software cutscenes work, what you see in a cutscene in the game besides the pre-rendered ones are actually happening in the game in real time. So it really is a work of art how they're able to go through and make them all so beautiful and seamless. One thing that kind of remains a mystery to this day, from the perspective of the lore, are the origins of Stormvale Castle and a lot of the architecture within Limgrave and the Weaving Peninsula. But my friend Aridin, who also has a channel on here, is currently doing an entire lore through of the game, and one of the things he was looking at was a lot of the iconography and the decoration of Stormvale Castle in the Chapel of Anticipation. But one that particularly stood out to him was this relief on the outside door, which depicts several women carrying around vases, and what he believes is being depicted here are Queen Merica and the Finger Maidens distributing the blessing or dew of the Erd Tree, and he compared this alongside the Erd Tree's favorite talisman and the Blessed Dew Talisman, which talks about an age of plenty before the shattering. But what he also noticed was that Stormvale Castle shares a lot of this same decoration and depiction of this age of plenty, and he's got a new video coming out soon breaking down the history of Limgrave. And I think if anybody can really figure out what happened here, he's definitely the guy to do it, so really looking forward to that video. And for the final one today, I wanted to elaborate further on a theory I proposed in the last Discoveries video, that when the meteorite that contained the Elden Beast landed, before the arrival of the Erd Tree, that the golden meteorites we find at the base of the mines possibly contain spores rather than golden amber, that subsequently caused the Erd Tree to grow like a mushroom out and over the Great Tree. And I do have a lot more evidence for this now. Now I got a lot of comments in the last video kind of bashing me because I said the Erd Tree looks more like a mushroom to me than an actual tree, but let me clarify. Yes, I know it's a tree. It has branches and it has leaves, but it's very slender trunk and canopy that looks like a mushroom cap really remind me of a species of mushroom called the chanterelle. And I think that if we view the Erd Tree from the perspective of a mushroom, we can understand exactly what it is much better. Now a lot of y'all commented that the Erd Tree was once grafted onto the 
the great tree. However, I don't think that's the case. At the entrance to the Erd tree, we can actually see the old bark of the great tree, and the iconography depicts the Elden Ring stabbing up through the great tree and emerging as the Erd tree. So rather than just simply taking the outside of the great tree, I believe the Erd tree is actually decomposing the great tree. And I think this is reinforced by the fact that ghosts who are no longer able to have their souls go into the great tree's roots emerge alongside a lot of these astral mushrooms. But that's about as far as I want to take that in today's video. That may warrant an entire video on its own exploring what exactly the Erd Tree is. But let me know if that's something y'all want to see. Either way though, that's going to pretty much do it for the video today. And if I showed you something that you didn't already know, be sure to hit that subscribe button down below. And if you have something you would like to be featured on these videos, join the Discord I'll have linked in the pinned comment. You can catch me on there pretty often. But leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it today, and I'll catch you in the next one.